For the way, those joining the webinar today, I'm going to wait about 30 seconds to allow others to join, and then we'll proceed with introductions. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar is the third in our series discussing the opportunities for tribes in the American Rescue Plan. Today we will be having a conversation with Brian Newland of the Department of Interior and Del Lavender about how tribes can maximize their American Rescue Plan opportunities. My name is Karen Diver and I serve on the Board of Governors for Honoring Nations. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School, which is the virtual site of today's program. I was previously the chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band and served in the Obama White House as a special assistant. I'm currently the senior advisor for Native American Affairs at the University of Minnesota. I want to start with a few announcements on behalf of the Ash Center at Harvard, which is our host for today's program. In particular, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. This event is being recorded and the video will be publicly available on Ash Center YouTube channel and through the website of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. You are welcome to submit questions anytime throughout today's program. Please do send them via the question and answer button, not the chat. We will not be monitoring the chat. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished speakers joining us today. First, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Brian Newland, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs at the US Department of Interior and nominee for Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. He was the, previously the president of the Bay Mills Indian Community and chief judge of the Bay Mills Tribal Courts. Also joining us today is Del Lavender, attorney and former assistant secretary of Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. Later in the program, we'll be joined by Jen Weddle. She's a citizen of Northern Cheyenne and co-chair of the American Indian Law Practice at the Greenberg Torig Law Firm. So, Brian Newland, thank you so much for making time. We know you're in the midst of responding to questions up on the Hill regarding your nomination. We look forward to that um, happening hopefully shortly. Um, I'm sure you'd like to get it settled as well. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> oh, upper Midwest, <laughs> Great Lakes, you betcha. Um, so, this session is about ARPA and how tribes can make the most of it and be prepared to take advantage of, of this opportunity for significant investments. And now tribes are in receipt of those initial funds. Have you been given any feedback about the impact that tribes think this will make in, this, uh, in their communities and for their tribal nations? And uh, are there any notable investments you'd like us to note or take notice of? Well, uh, first, Karen, thanks for uh, thanks for moderating today, um, and uh, Dell, thanks for being here and asking me to join as well. I'm uh, really excited to be here with friends and um, have this discussion, and it's a, it's just been a surreal experience going through this whole process, um, having you know worked at Interior as a as a counselor and uh, and now being in this position um, under ARPA. You know the feedback we've been getting. Uh, so far, at least in our office, has mostly been on process, um, and uh, you know, it has been it's been pretty positive feedback because I think folks uh, feel like um, they've been engaged in the in the development of the funding allocations, um, particularly actually with Treasury, um, they have the biggest pot of funding under the uh, under the rescue plan with twenty billion dollars. And, um, you know, so the, the feedback that I've gotten is that, that uh, people appreciate the opportunity to um, engage in consultation. Um, and more than that, uh, that the consultation actually uh, led to 
uh, specific changes in the implementation. And I can provide an example of that, Karen, at, at, at DOI, uh, you know, we had $1.7 billion, uh, only $1.7 billion of the rescue plan to distribute. And uh, under the BIA uh, portion, um, we had a, a pot of funds that was explicitly uh, set aside for law enforcement programs. And during the consultation, we, we heard consistently from tribes and public law 280 states, uh, which is a majority of federally recognized tribes uh, saying you know, these funds are, are unavailable to us because we don't have law enforcement programs here, but we still have public safety needs. And so we were able to take that feedback and build it into the distribution plan and then break out the law enforcement funding to include public safety funding for the public law 280 state tribes. And so, and, and there are examples of that um, at different agencies with responsibility for ARPA funds. And that's where most of the feedback that I've gotten has, has been that people have really appreciated the process. It sounds like your participation in these discussions amongst the federal agencies is being informed by your experience as a tribal president and the decisions that have to be made on the ground as everybody is responding to these complex issues. Yeah, and as you know, Karen, from being a tribal leader yourself, um, it, it's one thing to um, sit in our offices and, and say that we wanna, we wanna put money in this place or we wanna do a program on uh, any subject matter, but it doesn't always land the way you intend uh, on the ground in Indian country. And that's one of the things that I've tried to convey in my discussions uh, with the Treasury Department in particular is that helping people understand the practical impact, how this money gets drawn down, and then the considerations that tribal council members and tribal administrators have to uh, think about when they're implementing these programs in dealing with the oversight. And that really kind of uh, fed into this principle that we adopted early on that in addition to speed, we wanted to make sure that um, across the government with the rescue plan that we were being equitable and flexible uh, so that tribes didn't, you know, we're not regulating tribal governments, that tribes have the flexibility to make sure these funds are put to use in a way in their own communities that are helpful. You're absolutely right. With all the strings that might come with it, that decreases decision making in the best interest of community. So thanks, thank you so much for being that advocate. Um, Del, have you heard from tribes? Are they getting the answers that they need um, on allowable projects and allowable expenditures? Um, <clears throat> I think they're getting, I think they've got the base of information. And as you know, Treasury has rolling guidance, but I think. Um, I would say that this administration has done an incredible job on consultation very early on. Um, it can be very time consuming and uh, sometimes it seems like there's so many consultations, it's hard to have representation and to make that impact I think that some tribal leaders would like to have. And I think they've done a great job in incorporating that, having a reasonable timeline for the report. And we look forward to seeing what the report looks like and all the consultations and the rollout of other funding buckets outside it, that are in ARPA outside of Interior. And of course, the focus has been on Treasury. Um, I thought that the interim final rule that was uh, promulgated by Treasury was very comprehensive and gave a great background to know where they're coming from. So to the extent that um, Asia nominee and others were involved, we definitely appreciate that, uh, to see the orientation of, of what they're looking for for guidance. And then even today, um, Treasury announced additional frequently asked questions, which is on the website. So you can get some of these rolling guidance answers real time. And it's a 35 page document at this point. And the interim final rule is 150 pages. So I think there's quite a bit of guidance, but sometimes um, in Indian country, there's really site specific questions that they really would like to know before they proceed. And I think, um, as long as those continue to be answered in a comprehensive and flexible way, I think um, they're largely getting the answers they'd like, but I think there are some unknowns with some of the projects that fall in between 
what is the express guidance, and then what is the discretion to tribal governments? And I, I'm, Please I go was ahead. gonna, yeah, I was gonna add Karen to, to what Dell said. It, it, that that is uh, that's one of the things that uh, has been discussed internally uh, consistently is uh, the frustration that that tribes felt under the CARES Act with. Uh, you take some of your funds and you spend them, and then a, a guidance comes out you know, three months later that that says, "Hey, uh, you can't do that." Um, and we want to make sure that we're we're not being an impediment there, and, because tribes are making these decisions in real time and and costly investments um, at the local level, and so we want to make sure that, as, as Dell's saying, across the board, we're being responsive. Um, and it, and it's. It's a challenge too, with so much money and so many tribes and agencies involved. Um, but we understand the consequence if we're not timely in that effort. Um, customer service. Um, it's a wonderful notion out of the federal government, especially with so many moving parts, right? Um, and a welcome change. So we appreciate that. Um, both to what Dell was talking about and you as well, Brian, so tribes are gonna be taking on these major infrastructure projects. Um, that's a large focus of these monies, everything from housing to broadband. Um, are there tools that you're putting in place or um, staffing up in any way to help assist tribes in the implementation of these projects? I know there's some particular ones that tribes may need to grapple with, um, you know, land issues and rights away and things like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it, and you know, at, at Interior and with the BIA, uh, land and realty is kind of the bread and butter functions that we have to be good at because that's really at the heart of our re trust relationship with tribes. Um, and so, if you if you take things like broadband, for example, and this one billion dollar uh, broadband program that the administration has rolled out for Indian Country. Um, that does a little good if uh, all of those investments are gonna be tied up at the BIA waiting for approvals of rights of way and leases and permits and, and NEPA and what have you. And then um, as uh, participants here know, it, it, that frustration is, com is compounded when you go to the Rocky Mountain region and they do those permits and processes one way. And then you come over here to uh, the BI's Midwest region, and they do it a completely different way. And so we're trying to make sure that we standardize this process. And in May, um, the BI published a national policy memo on how to process rights of way um, in anticipation of all of this broadband work that's going to be done. So, uh, and we have our land title and records uh, regulations, which should be uh, finalized here. Um, I wish I could say any day, but very, very shortly um, and, and published as well uh, in an effort to just modernize and speed up our land processes because, uh, you know, whether it's, it's roads, broadband, um, you know, natural gas lines, transmission lines, um, and, and what have you, all of this infrastructure that serves as a platform for economic development, the BIA is going to have a role to play here, and we don't want to be the place where all of that goes to die. It seems that this would also have applicability of moving land into trust. Um, any thoughts on progress on maybe moving that along a little quicker? Yeah, well, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the first things we did was, um, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to, it's hard to, categorize it as progress, it's, it's putting it back in place where we made progress under the Obama administration with um, the solicitor's memos on um, uh, Cartieri and land in the trust in Alaska, and then re-delegating the decision-making out to the BIA field offices, because that stuff all got brought into uh, the BIA central office, which became a choke point. And then you saw just the dramatic slowdown of land in the trust uh, applications. And so we were able to do that um, really quickly. Um, everybody across Indian country is well aware of um, the impacts of frac fractionation and uh, the investments that were made um, 
to remedy that through the Cobell settlement, uh, which is coming to an end next year, uh, which is one of the reasons why we put another $150 million into uh, land consolidation uh, programming to go beyond the expiration of the Cobell settlement. <clears throat> because if we were to stop that effort now, that land would refractionate really quickly and go out of trust. And it just makes all of this economic development in Indian country much more difficult. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we've issued the mandate and the challenge to our field offices and the BIA that you're going to process land in the trust applications in a timely manner. Um, you know, we want to uh, consolidate Indian lands um, and uh, make sure that tribes have a homeland for uh, economic development and, and community living. Um, and so that's the expectation with our team. And I think all of these things just getting back to that point um, where we were under President Obama's administration, we saw a half million acres of land going to trust over eight years is, uh, is a, a great way to start an administration in the first 115 days or so. It's a challenge accepted, it sounds like. Yes. Um, we did have a follow-up for you, um, Brian, from an earlier remark about um, Public Law 280 states and the ability to use funding for law enforcement. Can you uh, reiterate what you said, maybe expand on it a little bit? Yeah, it, well, I want to I want to clarify it. So under the BIA's um, under the BIA's uh, ARPA funds. Um, we set aside $30 million for law enforcement programs um, for tribes that uh, are not in public law 280 states. And out of that, $8 million uh, was directed for direct service tribes, and the other $22 million were spread across uh, tribes that have 638 contracts for law enforcement programs. Um, for the tribes that are in uh, public law 280 states, which is, there are 229 in Alaska, and another more than 110 in California, just those two states alone. Um, we, we directed $30 million for those tribes for public safety. Um, that isn't necessarily for tribal police departments, um, but that can be used for public safety expenditures that fall outside of uh, you know, what we would think of as traditional policing or traditional law enforcement. Um, they can go into tribal courts, uh, social services, um, and things like that, all, all programs for tribes to use in public law 280 states that, that contribute to public safety. Thank you for that clarification. We appreciate it. Um, this one is for Dell and or Brian. Um, tribes have expressed interest in using our, their ARPA funding to build the long-term sustainability of their new and existing projects. For example, um, solar energy to reduce long-term operating costs of projects that they're building or that are existing. Has there been any guidance yet that you're aware of um, that can let tribes know if they can invest in stabilizing operations of their infrastructure projects? Yeah, Karen, maybe I'll um, begin and then I'm sure Brian will have things to add. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to just thank the department for restoring all the, the restoration of homelands um, work that was done. And that's very heartening to hear. And I think that is a huge win for the continuation of Indian land consolidation beyond Cobell. So that's great news to hear. And I think that's that's good news for Indian country as a whole. Um, I, you know, because of the what we discussed earlier, the, the, the length of the IFR, the internal final rule, and the um, frequently asked questions, if you were talking just about solar itself, you're gonna to have to look at different buckets. And I would say, look very closely at the guidance under the rescue plan. Water, sewer, and broadband are very broad and almost anything related to those. And if it's related to any of those, it's, it's gonna be presumptively um, eligible. Um, I think infrastructure in general, in general must be related to COVID relief or public health. And if it, if it relates to either of those two, then it's also kind of presumptively eligible um, to be used. And then to the extent that a tribal government uh, demonstrates its lost revenue, then that money is brought back. 
that's a pretty broad bucket for tribes to use for whatever they want for a solar project or anything else. Um, and I think another provision is responding to climate change and the reference to the EPA programs on clean drinking water and sanitation. But I think that the, the IFR does give deference to tribal governments. And if you're in a qualified census tract and that's defined in the, in the regulation, the proposed rule and the frequently asked questions, there's a presumption that it's okay. But so it doesn't say, you know, solar project per se. So you would have to see if it fits in one of those buckets to make sure that, that it's okay as an eligible use. But I think there are a number of areas you could look to for guidance. It would seem, Dell, that under that scenario, that if it's a new project that's responding under the guidelines, you might want to build some of those stability factors in up front, because then it would be a project cost. Yeah, and yeah, thank you, Karen, for that response. And also, um, pre-development costs for any of these projects are allowable and eligible. So that's a because that, oftentimes in project development the pre-development costs are what holds a project up where you can't get it done because of all the survey engineering, all of the land work that's done. And that's why the LTRO update is so important to get that uh, expedited and ready and modernized so that people can move forward on the projects that they wanna see in their, in their tribal homelands. Thank you for reiterating that. I don't think that tribes are really good about necessarily understanding that the thoughtfulness they put in prior to the start of a project is actually a part of the project costs. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that, Brian? Yeah, uh, well, I, th I think it's um, one of the things I wanna uh, make sure that tribes are thinking about is that these funds uh, from different agencies uh, through ARPA can be complementary if, if tribes take uh, a beat um, to plan out um, how they want to use them and what they, what your goals are, what your needs are at home. So, for example, uh, the BIA's funds uh, included seven hundred million dollars uh, as aid to tribal governments, essentially, uh, and and it's no year money, so it doesn't it doesn't come with a, a timeline on it, and it can support tribal government operations. So, if you have that in addition to the budgeted money that's coming down through the Bureau of Indian Affairs it might not make sense to take your funding that's coming from treasury and to plow it into tribal government programs. Um, and you can think about what you're allowed to do with your tribal government funding and then uh, allocate some of those costs there and save your treasury dollars for some of the higher cost uh, COVID response items you wanna do with those other eligible uses of funding. And that goes for IHS funding as well, which we haven't uh, talked a lot about. So it's. The, this planning is really important. And I know from firsthand experience uh, under the CARES Act as a tribal leader, there's just so much pressure on tribal leaders uh, from community members, um, from employees, um, you know, business development partners, or, or you know, anyone who's just got an opinion on tribal affairs uh, to just put these dollars out there um, as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, I mean, that, that's of course that that can be done. Uh, but if you wanna have a lasting impact that makes your community more resilient in the face of things like pandemics or public health crises that come from lack of water or um, education needs from broadband, take a beat and understand where these pots of funds are coming down from through ARPA, what the eligible uses are for all of them sketch out what your objectives are, and then apply the funds strategically, knowing their deadlines, their eligible uses, so that you're not, you're not wasting that, that money um, in setting your community back. Yeah, and if I, if I could add to that, Karen, I would just say, um, I couldn't agree more with uh, Asian nominee Newland that um, the CARES Act was meant to respond very quickly. And so, that's what happened was you, you get the equipment out, sanitizers, PPE, all that stuff. It wasn't meant for infrastructure, which I think a lot of people would like to have utilized it for in, in Indian country. And so because ARPA is a five plus year window for the statute before it expires, there's time to engage in that strategic planning and sit down and look at all the different funding 
um, possibilities across the agencies and then map it out much like Brian is saying and we've engaged I've engaged with a couple of communities on this very process and it's been really helpful and then they realize uh, tribal leaders and tribal departments realize you know there's not a rush to do something about this even though there is this pressure and they do want to respond but you can actually look at these longer generational projects that could be available when it's water sewer broadband the connectivity all of those things and public health and and one other thing i think is very exciting and and helpful is that there's a lot of mental health dollars in arpa and as a result of the pandemic um, i think a lot of tribal communities are seeing you know the the mental health challenges that were already under chronically underfunded were just exacerbated under these stay-at-home orders and and other things and people losing jobs and not having enough homes on the on the tribal homelands. And so I think just having that opportunity to have a generational change is really exciting and it can be overwhelming as well. So it takes planning. Thank you both for reiterating the fact that um, this is really a time to be thoughtful, um, that the pandemic and taking that time to really think about it is a chance for you to identify both the strengths of your communities as well as where you saw weaknesses and being able to respond to those things. Um, that's why there's money for broadband. We found out that we needed to do telehealth and our kids needed to, um, you know, all of a sudden pivot um, their K-12 learning and their higher ed learning and we didn't have access to these things. But so now is the time to be really thoughtful and say, you know, where do we need to make those long-term investments so that we are ready for the next event? And it is when, not if, right? Um, so thank you for that. I would like to remind everyone that we are taking questions and answers um, where our planning committee can answer you directly. They are doing so in the question and answer um, box, not the chat, which is not gonna be moderated. Um, and you can also put any questions you may have um, that are not about specific product projects or asking for specific guidance, but uh, just kind of clarity around um, ARPA funding in general. Just gonna take a peek at those real quick. Um, our panel, our, our planning committee is doing a good job of answering the questions and answers and referring people to the various um, guidance that has come out from uh, Treasury. Anything else you'd like to share, Brian or Dell, from what you know is happening? So DOI, um, there will be more resources coming from ARPA through DOI, but those will be of a competitive nature, correct, Brian? Um, which ones, what are you referring to, Karen? Which, well, which part we, of funding? we know that there's been um, funding that has come to the agencies that will be a direct distribution to tribes based on their employment um, and or their population. Are there other sources of funding that are coming into Interior BIA that tribes will have to compete for? I think most of our uh, most of our ARPA funds uh, through Interior are are formula driven and are uh, in the process if they haven't already been distributed um, uh, out to tribes and out to BIE schools and tribal colleges. Um, they're they're going out in a non competitive basis through six thirty eight contracts. Also, oh, you're negotiating those directly. Um, no, those, well, those are, it's just being drawn down through oh. existing funding means and it's, uh, we're trying to make it painless. Well, God love you guys for that. Uh, you know, a, a, a piece uh, a piece of this that's been overlooked um, within Interior is the, the amount of funding that went out through the BIE, which was another $850 million. Um, uh, and that was divided up between K through 12 schools and the Bureau of Indian Education System, as well as tribal colleges and universities. Um, and and um, those of you who uh, have any familiarity with the Bureau of Indian Education school system know about the historical 
uh, funding challenges that a lot of those uh, schools have faced. So that that was a huge investment um, in those schools. Uh, we have uh, set aside a good chunk of that uh, to improve uh, the Bureau's uh, learning management system and IT so that we can connect with students and, and really make those BIE schools more accessible uh, to our own students and their families going forward, even after uh, the pandemic. And um, you know, on the tribal college side, a lot of tribal colleges um, were getting into uh, online learning and distance learning, and, and these funds can help facilitate that. And you, you, know, you think about now tying that into the president's uh, push on infrastructure and, and development and worker training. I mean, tribal colleges are just uh, such an incredible resource uh, for uh, communities where they're located on all of these fronts, when it, whether it's access to higher education or job training um, or facilitating infrastructure development in your community. And so that pot of funds, that $850 million that went out, um, has a potential to really help students in the BIE system start to catch up in tribal colleges to be ready um, you know, for, for the coming investment in training and distance learning and infrastructure. That's a really important point. Um, you know, we talk a lot about taking care of our communities, but our community also includes our workforce, which is partially our citizens and partially not. And um, tribal colleges are important, not only for tribal citizens, but in many communities, they're the only higher education that's available and you'll get uh, surrounding communities um, members participating in tribal colleges as well. Huge um, necessity for us building our workforce. Um, um, yes. I was just gonna ask something I saw in the, it was either the Q and A or chat, somebody was asking about consultants and being able to plan and that actually is in the frequently asked questions that it is allowable expense that you can hire um, consultants, attorneys, you know, engineers, planners, um, accountants, whoever it is, um, workforce folks to help you do the planning on the ARPA dollars and other dollars, all the around all the different agencies. Another thing I wanted to mention too is, um, and I think it's important to emphasize the guidance that's being provided as voluminous as it is, is not exhaustive. So, um, you know, whatever they say, that's not the final list. If it's something that's akin to something that would qualify as an eligible use under one of the different things, then it could be eligible. And so um, I guess seeking guidance on that, um, if it doesn't specifically answer, because I think they're going to continue to try to respond. So. And I do wanna note that um, at the end of today's webinar, Jennifer Weddle will be um, giving us a quick overview update of what we know from Treasury. They just released some facts today. Um, additional guidance that answers many specific questions about allowable uses of the funds. The link to that will be made available on the Harvard Projects website, but for now it's also available in the question and answer um, section. Karen, can I just um, go while you're searching for, yep. for uh, uh, questions in the q and I, I want to go back to the strategic planning uh, piece because I, I, I don't think it can be emphasized enough. If, if you look at the rescue plan as part of a larger um, effort, um, this year's budget request from the president for Indian programs across the federal government was also $30 billion. And then you have the uh, American Jobs Plan um, infrastructure package, which is still being worked out, which will um, you know, likely lead to uh, billions more dollars available to Indian country for infrastructure investment. Um, you know, this is, you're talking, when you throw the CARES Act in on top of that, almost $100 billion uh, that's coming into Indian country at one time. And uh, 10 years from now, uh, I think it's going to be important for tribal communities to, to look back and say, we've got something to show for that for the next, as you, as you said it, Karen, there, there will be a next time, whether it's a pandemic or with climate change or something. And at, with this level of investment and this, this amount of funds that's coming into Indian country, 
you don't want to look back and say, what do we have here in our community to show for this now? Um, you know, it, it, it's very, it, it, it is very easy to um, spend this money without, uh, without a lot of thought and planning, and then you'll be in that position um, as a tribal community. So it's going to be important to take, a, as Del was saying, to take a minute um, to uh, plan for this, to make sure that uh, you're, you're putting the infrastructure and the programs in place uh, within your tribal communities um, so that you got something to show for this and that when the next uh, pandemic or natural disaster comes that your community is able to weather it and keep your people safe and healthy. I would also like to put in a plug for um, people looking at resiliency really broadly. Infrastructure can also be around climate resiliency. Um, the, um, Brian mentioned it, you know, of, of looking whether it's a, a natural disaster or this is in a public disaster, but this is the type of planning and thought process you can go through of, you know, how can we make sure our communities are safe? And that's everything from food security to energy security, housing security, public health security. So um, this is your chance to look at it really expansively. We do have a question for you, Brian. Um, can you discuss the issue of um, supplant, supplanting funds and ARPA? Um, this came up in our last webinar as well. Um, you know, you can't necessarily use federal money to leverage federal money, but there was some talk and notion of stacking. And you mentioned this a bit, um, you know, you're gonna be able to replace some lost revenue. Um, and that's your, your tribal treasury and provide you some more flexible opportunities, correct? Yeah, that's, that's a lot of that funding, the biggest amount of funding is gonna come down through the treasury department. And as Del was saying, there, there are, um, it's gotta be tied to COVID response, um, but there's a lot of flexibility built into that interpretation. Um, there are some infrastructure allowed. Um, and so, you know, on our, our BIA side, for example, with the 700 million that went out to tribal governments, that's no year money, uh, which means that you, you can use that to fund your tribal government programs um, at any time. It doesn't have to be by the end of this fiscal year or next fiscal year or the one after. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if this is what the question was getting at, but you, you don't want to take, if you're thinking, oh, I've got to fund I've got to find a way to fund um, you know, this public works program within tribal government to keep folks employed. Um, if you have BIA money that can be applied in future years uh, as well, it, it might not make as much sense to take the treasury economic uh, loss money and put it there um, because you've got other funds available and then that money is available to put on something else. That makes sense. This one's another one for Brian. You're, you're our guest star today. Um, have you encountered any surprises in your new role that you did not anticipate? Um, gosh, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to pick some. Um, <laughs> you know, I, to be honest, it, it was a lot like, for me, it was a lot like coming into tribal office. When I first uh, ran for tribal chairperson, people were saying, some people say, why would you want to do that? It's a thankless job. It's a miserable job. Nobody's happy. And I found it to be very rewarding, actually, quite the opposite to do that. And, and I had some folks, to, you know, kind of uh, personally, who I knew personally, you know, make similar comments going back into government. Um, and it's been, um, it's been really rewarding. And I guess that wouldn't necessarily be a surprise, but um, I know we're still early on in the administration, so you do get a bit of a honeymoon period, but all of the, um, even people who are really frustrated or upset with some, some of the decisions that get made, um, the relationships have been very positive and, and people have been very supportive, not just of me personally, but of what we're trying to do. And so it, in a sense, I guess that would be surprising to some people because um, you know often these jobs are very difficult and you do get uh, 
criticism from all corners, but um, most folks are, have, have really been interested in, in offering their support to get to uh, these objectives because they're really shared objectives, which is to help Indian people in, in Indian communities. Um, and so I don't know if that qualifies as a surprise, Karen, but that's been the coolest part of this. It's a good Actually, surprise. Karen, if you don't mind, I mean, I remember being in the Obama administration. We had Secretary Salazar at the time, and of course, Sally Jewell was there after that with Kevin Washburn. And um, just a question for Brian. Um, I remember going into meetings and if there was disputes among assistant secretaries or bureaus, and then you'd have to sit down at the secretary's desk, and then you would have a, not a debate, but you would have a discussion about the various interests, and then the secretary would have to say, oh, I think in this case, we're going to go with BLM, or, you know, okay, that one, I, I think BIA is correct, or, you know, that there might be National Park Service really needs this issue. I was curious what it's like for you right now having the first native or indigenous secretary, you know, to have the person deciding those conflicts and making the ultimate decision. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, that part has been, um, <clears throat> I don't want to say surreal because that, that doesn't feel like an appropriate description, but it's, it, it's, it's been incredible. Um, it, it, so in addition to having Secretary Holland um, in office, I want to come back to that, Del, but there are 40, more than 40 Native appointees across the government, and many of them at the department. And historically, uh, you know, within the uh, Department of the Interior, um, there are uh, all of the Indian political appointees are like, you know, packed into Indian affairs. And so... It, you know, when you have these meetings with Bureau of Land Management, for example, or National Park Service on an issue affecting tribes, you kind of have to do the Indians 101 talk with them uh, just to get them to a place where you can uh, then get to the substance. And it's very time consuming. So when you only have four years and everybody's got a massive portfolio and you've got to spend weeks educating people just so that you can have a conversation about the issues, that that structural problem makes it difficult to solve a lot of problems for tribes. And so having uh, appointees across the department who understand Indian country because they've come from Indian country is enormously helpful because you can just skip that. Um, I, I remember when, when Dell worked at the department before and, and I was uh, serving under him, that we, we would, uh, when we first came in in 2009, so many uh, tribal consultants and attorneys and representatives would come in and they'd spend the first 30 minutes of an hour long meeting explaining to us, you know, basically what it's like to be Indian. And then after, you know, after six months, we finally said, you know, guys, you don't, you don't have to do that with us. And it saves time so you can get at these things and having the diversity of tribal appointees across the department um, really is helpful. And then uh, you know, for Secretary Holland uh, being there, if you take something like uh, the boarding school initiative that she announced yesterday, she just gets it. She, she, she just knows. She knows why it's important. Um, we, don't have to, we don't have to put together reams of paper to explain the legacy of boarding schools to her or why Indian country was so moved by the discovery of um, all those children uh, buried in Canada. Um, she just gets it. And so rather than taking uh, a year to get to a point to, to try to convince her that it's not only safe to respond to this, but it's also the right thing to do, you know, it, it's, it's, it's driven by her. Um, because she understands the same with violence against women or um, what it means when somebody says to the secretary, like, I can't, you know, my kids are having a hard time at school because they literally have to get on their bike and pedal to the end of our three mile dirt road just to get a signal for their iPad so they can email their homework. She knows all of that because she's seen it. And that's, you know, when you think about, I have to stop 
and remind myself of the moment that I'm in and not just get so caught up in the work because in the history of the United States, that's never happened. That's unusual. And um, it's, it's really incredible. And, and she's just a wonderfully kind and decent person, which also has um, been reflected in the team at the department. Um, these are intense jobs and people who come to these positions often um, have led big careers up to that point and um, you know, big egos to go along with it. And everybody seems to be rowing in the same direction. And that's really a credit to her. She said that tone. That is, that gives me hope. And so for all of you that are there, um, thank you for being a part of that team where it seems like there's fertile ground to really move the needle for Indian country. Brian, this is an interesting one for me. Um, so this is not like typical ARPA, put in a program or build a project and it'll fix it. This actually seems like it might need the entire Department of Interior as well as maybe some other agency folks. If we're saying one of the infrastructure needs um, that Indian country can work on is water and they're dealing with a drought in the West and there's complicated water, water rights issues, multi-jurisdictional, non-settled water rights agreements, primacy issues, treaty rights. Is Department of Interior having any um, discussions about how complex issues like that might be worked on in order to assist tribes with their basic needs? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> There, there's a lot of discussion around drought issues and water. And one of the, one of the really frustrating parts about it is, um, uh, as Dell knows and, and Jen and, and others here, it, India water rights settlements take, you know, in many cases, decades to put together. And so you get to these settlements um, and ideally they come with funding for infrastructure and then you, you can turn to the next one. And um, now it, with drought conditions, not only do you have to you know, keep on track to negotiate additional settlements or, or you know, tribes coming in with, with uh, proposals to address their water rights claims, but now you have to look back to the tribes where you thought you've resolved these issues and allocated them because the water, uh, the quantity of water coming into these projects is not what anybody anticipated. Um, and so that's, that's something that's occupying a lot of uh, time and attention um, at the department and, and through many bureaus. Um, you know, we have uh, Assistant Secretary Tanya Trujillo now um, at the Department from Water and Science who's uh, worked in government before. And, and she, she's uh, somebody who understands Indian water rights issues and, and the implications of drought coming from New Mexico. And um, she's been a great partner to have. And, and again, the secretary also understands this, but um, you know, it, it's, it's scary to think of, you know, these water shortages for tens of millions of people <laughs> across the West and it, it being expected to find solutions in a short span of time. Um, it's, it, this is going to this is going to occupy more and more um, attention for public policymakers at, at, across the board because um, unless we fix climate change, it's it's something that's going to continue. Karen, if I could add to that, yes. um, you know, there's the Secretary's Indian Water Rights Office (SIWRO). Whenever there are issues involving tribes, they're usually um, people familiar because they're spread across all the different uh, bureaus in interior, but they have a unifying person up at the top and central office in DC. And then there's usually a point person in this case, it's Elizabeth Klein, who's a senior counselor to Secretary Holland. And she works through with all the different bureaus whenever there's a complex multi jurisdictional issue. So I just, I want to point that out because um, there's, there are teams in different regions that work with them and then they look into issues when there are complicated problems like this involving Indian water. Thank you, thank you. And hopefully um, the questioner will, will follow up with that office. 
One more for Brian, and then we're going to go to Jen for an update on the latest information. Um, the reporting requirements um, are costly, time consuming, unnecessary, and disproportionately disadvantages smaller tribes um, that have less capacity. Um, any thought to re evaluating formulas to take into account the actual cost of living, um, the cost of goods and services, tribes that are on the high end of just thresholds don't out adequately always mm -hmm. ca uh, capture need. Yeah, so I think this speaks more to the treasury allocation, but um, you know, okay, we were a part of, I'm, I'm happy to talk about, it. we were a part of the the discussions uh, with Treasury and other agencies, um, there was a lot of thought put into to this um, because with 576 tribes, um, there are so many different circumstances. Um, and one of the things that we tried to fall back on was making sure that it was equitable and, and also uh, that this wasn't burdensome on tribes for administration and reporting. And the more specific and targeted you try to build the methodology you know to account for things like that actually the more burdensome the reporting requirements will be on the back end because you have to you have to be able to verify i'm getting more money because we have a higher uh, you know consumer price index uh, where we are or we have a you know a salary the average salaries and wages in our our area are low and so um you know, we wanted to also make sure that we were getting, we, the federal government, were getting these funds out and, uh, quickly as well. And so you're trying to balance all these factors. Um, and the tre I know Treasury was trying to make up for it on the aggregate level by coming up with a, a formula that was equitable for those tribes, many of whom are in Alaska, um, uh, were going to... Apologize for that. Um, many of whom were, were, you know, are faced with these challenges, and we wanted to make sure that they were not left out or left behind in the formula, and we're getting an equitable share. Of it. Thank you. Unsatisfactory for that. answer. Um, you know, it's just it, it's it's impossible to to design a surgical program uh, like this in this time frame. Um, you know, in, in there was a, there really was a, a desire to be equitable. Well, and I mean, what you're speaking to is, you know, unforeseen consequences, right? right. Um, and trying to think these things through so that, um, frankly, in some ways it's like mitigating risk, right? Um, and, and still being expedient um, and, and fair. So thank you for that. Um, we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna check in with Jen Weddle for the latest updates um, from Treasury. Thank you, Karen. And I hope everybody can hear me okay now. We're good. I'm, I'm coming to you live from the heart of the infrastructure deficit on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation where my laptop is exactly positioned to be able to get the one bar of Wi-Fi and <laughs> precariously balanced on old uh, lean shake jars here at the tribal office. So um, if Melissa could bring up my slide, uh, there's been a lot of activity happening uh, with Treasury and I've been kind of curiously typing answers to some of the questions in the chat. Uh, but really importantly, the second allocation information is now due uh, on a second extension on Friday, July 9 at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, if you don't get your tribal uh, employment information verified by that time, you will not be eligible for a second allocation. Uh, this is the remaining $6.65 billion that Treasury has yet to allocate pursuant to their formula. Uh, they intend to do that now, uh, we think, in late July. Uh, the FAQs still refer to a late June determination, but I think that's, that's just a typo um, in, in them getting those out. Um, they need to know how big the pie is before they allocate it. 
Um, these, importantly, are the tribe, tribal government's 2019 employment information, uh, not any updated information. Uh, Treasury is simply asking you to verify uh, what your uh, total employment numbers were in 2019. Uh, and they uh, aggregate that across quarters for those tribes that have more uh, seasonal employment. And that's all based off uh, your IRS form 941s. Uh, for all entities, including the tribal government itself, as well as any enterprises uh, in which the tribe owns a 51% or more interest. Uh, as, as Karen had mentioned, uh, Treasury has, since our last installment, uh, issued two more sets of frequently asked questions uh, set on June 17th and uh, June 23rd. Uh, there is a live link uh, here and it's on the treasury.gov website. Um, that uh, June 23rd set was just published a few hours ago, um, but I've highlighted on the slide what the new questions were in both sets of FAQs. The FAQs from last week focused largely on broadband so any of you tribal leaders that are really focused on broadband, uh, these questions 6.8, 6.9, 6.10, and 6.11 uh, will be uh, very important uh, for you uh, to review. And then today, um, I think two uh, helpful but not, but not yet fully baked uh, answers to really take a close look at. Uh, one is, um, uh, the 2.17, uh, which refers to direct payments. And I think um, Treasury is displaying both one, some flexibility for tribal governments to get additional relief to those who need it, um, but also telling us that we need to be careful uh, in those considerations and make sure any direct relief is necessary, um, taking into account earlier uh, federal stimulus payments, as well as direct relief that may have been available under the CARES Act or other programs, such as the uh, emergency rental assistance uh, programs, uh, to make sure that money is actually going to people who need it. Uh, and Treasury is also encouraging more specific program dollars rather than simply direct payments. So uh, food programs, um, uh, small business loans, uh, things that are tied to a specific activity rather than simply distributed uh, per capita. Uh, 4.8 uh, is another uh, great new FAQ that I think demonstrates Treasury's flexibility and broad in investment in public safety uh, and taking, a, again, a broad view of what that means um, in terms of underlying public health. Uh, hiring more law enforcement, caseworkers, addressing substance abuse, uh, and mental and behavioral health, which I know a lot of tribes are very focused on. Um, there's really good stuff in there, and I think a lot of flexibility. But as we've talked about in previous sessions, it's really going to come down to tribal government's judgment and making findings about the programs that you're investing in are both COVID responsive and responsible. Uh, and to the, the great conversation that Dell and Brian had about strategic planning, um, you know, really trying to maximize the benefit of these dollars for the, the next seven generations and beyond. Um, you know, strong recommendation for tribes to engage in strategic planning and especially by engaging uh, your youth, elders, veterans, and homeless uh, who stand to really benefit the most and who've been among the, the hardest hit in the pandemic. So. I, th I think they're giving us good things to think about, and the key is going to be to take that out to your own communities uh, and get their guidance back as well. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I would like to take the time to thank uh, Brian Newland and Dell for being on our panel. Um, you gave us a lot of information um, about how all this is rolling out, how you're influencing it. Um, how DOI is upholding its trust responsibility during this process, how tribes prioritize, what you're hearing they're dealing with. Jennifer, you've just been a, a workhorse in the chat along with Harvard Project staff in answering those questions that we could um, in the chat function. I will reiterate, um, this is guidance for all of you. It can give you initial um, 
impressions of this guidance, please contact your own legal counsel and financial staff, auditing staff um, for clarity regarding all of this guidance. Sometimes we're hearing it on the fly. Um, Jennifer was uh, referencing some of it that just came out today um, and we're still reading it. So um, please do follow up um, with your own experts um, to get verification, but we're happy to guide you. Thank you all so much. Um, so we're gonna have another session in two weeks, every two weeks. We talked a lot today about the importance of planning and prioritizing and taking advantage of this. Our next session is actually going to be on strategic planning and implementation. How do you go through that analysis of what's going on in your tribal community? How can you make the most of it? Where are your strengths, weaknesses? We're going to bring you through that process in a real practical way um, so that you have the tools to work with your leadership, your staff leadership, your executive leadership, your elected leadership, your community, um, and engage them in this process. So please join us then. We also heard a lot today about mental health and the strain. You know, our communities have strengths and resilience, um, but we've also have trauma and have overcome trauma. And at any given time, we can fall on either side of that spectrum individually and collectively, right? So a future session, we're gonna be looking at uh, mental health resources, behavioral health resources um, that are coming um, out of agencies that can help tribal communities and through ARPA. So, um, please join us in the future. Please share these invitations um, with your network of concerned organizations. Um, I noticed in the chat, one of the links wasn't working. We'll fix that on the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development's website. So please check that. This will be, this is recorded. It will be posted there um, as well. So thank you all. And we hope to see you in two weeks and best wishes to all of you in your communities as we move through this process. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Oh.